right, guys, uh, we're going to get started here. So for those of you who don't know, we're at uh, Exchange.js. It's Edmonton's JavaScript meetup. So thank you for coming. I, I know some of you have been here before. I can see some people who haven't. So if this is your first time, welcome. Maybe just a show of hands. Who's here for their first time tonight? Awesome. Great. OK, everyone be nice to them. Let's try not to scare them away. So thank you very much. We'd like to start with a little bit of an introduction every month. Uh, because we have new people coming, and if you're like me and are terrible with names, it's useful to know who you're sitting with and uh, who you're talking to. So every time that we do this, we try to have a different question. This month, seeing how you're probably still all uh, stealing your kids' Halloween candy or you know things like that, uh, may have had a couple over the last few days, I thought, let's forget about JavaScript tonight, uh, at least for this question, and ask, what's your favorite Halloween treat? So why don't we start over on this end? Uh, we've got a microphone we're going to be passing around tonight. And uh, if the microphone comes your way, it's your turn to answer. So be ready. Uh, hi, I'm Nick. Um, my uh, favorite uh, Halloween treat, I would have to say, is coffee crisp. It's sort of the best thing in the world. So yeah. Nice. Good choice. Hi, I'm Carrie, and mine's O. Henry. I'm Nick, and uh, mine is any house that gives out the full candy bars. <laughs> <laughs> candy bar. uh, hi, I'm Aaron, and uh, I don't know. Sleep? Yeah, sleep. Sleep's pretty good. Nice. <laughs> hi, I'm Joel, and I like uh, coffee crisp, but eat more as if I can get them. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Alex. I like pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm Steve. Uh, my favorite is Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Hi, I'm Amelia, and I've recently discovered that two cheer rolls can be really good when they're not all dried out. Uh -huh. <laughs> Katya, uh, my favorite is Dairy Milk. I'm Dave. My favorite is I only have to go trick or treating once, and with three kids, I have three times the amount of stuff to choose from, so everything. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Usman, and my favorite treat is golden fish. Um, my name is Castutas, and I don't know something with more chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate's good. I'm Curtis, and say Swedish berries. Hey, I'm William, or Will, <coughs> and I'd have to say uh, single malt. Uh, I'm Rodney. Um, I have no idea. I'm going to say pizza because I'm going to get another piece. <laughs> uh, I'm Ben, and uh, I guess like those little uh, like caramels. Uh, my name's Carl, and I also like Reese's peanut butter cups. I'm Riley, uh, and I also go hard on the peanut butter cups. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Jan, and I have to say uh, Twinkies because I'm from Germany. We don't have them there. I'm from Germany too, but I like everything with peanut butter. Um, I, my name is Dan, and I think I like the crunchy bars. Uh, my name is Casey, and. And on Tuesday, somebody was handing out little puzzles, which I appreciated because anything that gets my kid less gets my kids less candy is probably good. I'm <laughs> um, Christian. First Halloween ever, no candy. Nice. Oh, okay. um, so I'm Mark, and I'm going to vote for the cheesies because I love those little cheesy bags. Um, all right. Uh, for those of you who don't have internet on your phone or other devices, if you need it, there is free Wi-Fi here. Uh, Startup Edmonton Guest and Mercer 2016 is also up on the board over there. Uh, and just a reminder that the next meetup we are having in December, it's going to be December 2nd, so right at the start of the month. Uh, and one last thing, we uh, have brought in a code of conduct here over the last couple meetings. We just wanted to make sure that everyone knew that this was a kind of safe, welcoming environment. Generally, don't be jerks and you know, be decent to each other and you're okay. Uh, we have the whole thing written out if you want to on our website. But uh, yeah, I think it's pretty clear. Okay, and to start it off tonight, uh, I'm just going to give a quick intro to the talks, and we'll skip doing that part later on when we uh, have our speakers individually. So we've got two talks tonight. Uh, the first one, Casey is up. Uh, he's going to introduce the script tag. It's one of those basic, essential things that you probably use in like every app that you've ever written, 
But I was surprised how many things, at least I didn't know about it. Uh, there's lots of interesting little attributes. There's been some cool changes to it over the last little while. So yeah, that's going to be our intro talk, is a, a basic introduction to script and some of the cool things you can do with that, how it works. And then we also have a really cool deep dive that kind of follows up on Ben's talk last month. We're going to be going into the garbage collector in V8. And specifically the reason we're talking about that uh, and why you as a web developer should care about it is because it can have big impacts on the performance of your app and your code. So uh, I was able to get a little sneak preview of this talk already today and I'm pretty excited. So I hope you guys enjoy it too. Uh, the discussion tonight too, I'm just give you a little bit to prime, get your thoughts going a little. We're going to be talking about the future of JavaScript. So we'll let you guys kind of direct where that goes. I've got a few, uh, few ideas. But uh, yeah, think about that. Think about what you'd like to see, what drives you crazy that will maybe hopefully go away. And we'll share some thoughts later. A uh, pretty quick wrap up of news this month. Um, we're looking for more talks. <coughs> so if you guys have a talk, I was actually going to get an awesome one today, so that's good. But our talk calendar could definitely use a few more things in it. So we try to get them planned as early as we can. It gives us a chance to help you guys get ready. We're always happy to be there to you know, practice with you, give you feedback if you want it, things like that. You don't have to do that, but we're there if you want it. Um, if you're interested, just go to exchangejs.com slash talks, and there's a big sign up to talk thing. It just takes you to our spreadsheet, so you can put yourself in exactly where uh, you see it fitting. And yeah. Oh, is there, you know, I typed that on my phone this afternoon, so. Um, Oh, you're right, exchanges. Yeah, it's Exchange JS. Sorry about that. Um, I'll fix that. But yeah, if you go to our website too, you'll see it right <coughs> off the, uh, up at the top. There's a little link to talks there too. Thank you. <laughs> um, our YouTube channel, uh, I noticed a few more visits to it. We uh, haven't posted the videos from this year because I'm still learning how to make some nice little title things to go at the end of it. But uh, we are making some progress and I think we'll have those up hopefully in the next couple weeks here. So in the meantime, we have all of our past talks from last year are there, and um, we will be posting a lot more very soon, so check it out. It's a great way to kind of go through some of the more in-depth talks and see things at your own pace. Uh, we've got a code night coming up on November 15th. I was talking to Sean uh, on the way here, and it sounds like we're going to be diving into WebGL this month. So if you've done it, want to come help other people, maybe rig up some stuff, if you're new to it, we'll probably work through a couple examples. I, uh, I saw... There's like a poly library website now that has a bunch of 3D assets that are really fun. Um, and those all work with WebGL uh, and I think with 3GS. So we might you know, try to load up something from that and make a little game or something. So if you're interested in WebGL, 3D on the web, come check it out. The Jobber offices are pretty sweet. So it's a nice place to just hang out to. And I just bother you mm -hmm. with other questions yeah. then too? Yep. So Brad could start yeah, so I, I actually won't be the one running it. Sean will be running it. <coughs> um, but we're still kind of trying to formalize what we're going to do in terms of what we're going to work through together. So if you guys have things that you would specifically like to do with WebGL, hit us up either on Twitter or, you know, Sean, you can send him a message too. And um, yeah, we'd love to hear what you guys want to do that night. So. <coughs> um, also, we've got the code retreat happening at DeFacto. I have been to a couple of these. They're lots of fun. Um, they're a really cool way to kind of go and just try out different things. And I think, was anyone from, yeah, I heard about someone yeah, from DeFacto yeah. here tonight that can just kind of explain it a bit better than I can, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah it's going to take a minute. So, um, regardless of your programming preferences, your experience, um, come down. Uh, we'll be kind of going through some really quick coding challenges. Uh, you'll be working in pairs, and uh, you can switch up the person that you paired with, uh, activity by activity. Um, and the entrance is free, it's happening at the factory, so not too far from here, and uh, lunch and freshness are provided. So. I, I know one thing I'll add to that too is I, <coughs> I've done it a couple times now, and you don't want to be wasting time setting up your tools or your environment. So if you know you want to try like a new, pro like, I think I tried Clojure and I spent half the time trying to like install stuff that I didn't realize I needed to install. So make sure you've done like the hello world or whatever it is in the language and library you're using because you won't have time to do it on the day. All right, okay. Um, and if they want to know more about that, uh, where's the best place to go? Can uh, they just Google that or? Best place to go, yeah, you can also Google uh, Edmonton Code Retreat 2017. The okay. Eventbrite page will show up. Okay. Um, my contact info is on the Eventbrite page as well. And I'm sure you're probably going to have a link somewhere. Yeah, we'll tweet it out and stuff too. So, so I, yeah. okay, awesome. Um, are you coming to drink center too? Do you know or? Uh, 
Uh, I can hang around for a little bit, yeah. So if there's any questions, like feel free to come up, ask me about it. Awesome. Um, so we've got a bunch of jobs right now on the job board. We've got some awesome jobs from uh, Investopedia, from Jobber. And we also, thanks to some work by Casey, have a way now to post your own jobs on the job board. Because right now we've been posting everything kind of manually as people send us emails and stuff like that. So now you can post it. We do a little bit of moderation just to make sure it's all you know, good. Uh, and then you can just add your own jobs there. So if you haven't checked it out before, uh, exchangejs.com slash jobs. And uh, yeah, there's lots of great opportunities right now. So thank you. And with that, why don't we move into our talks? Oh, cool. There we go. We've got a bit of a fun topic. Uh, this is something that I like to just think about sometimes because you know, with meetup and stuff too, we want to stay on top of things. So I want to talk about the future of JavaScript. Because it could all be rainbows and unicorns and sparkles. Or it could be something else. So with that in mind, I thought let's talk about it and see what people think. So the first thing that like, immediately came to mind is I'm sure you're all dealing with this where your apps every year or two seem like they change quite a bit. So I was wondering, just kind of close your eyes for a minute. You know, imagine what you're doing right now, what you think you'll be doing, say, in two years. I just picked that date. Um, and what a typical JavaScript app then might look like. You know, is it running in the browser in the server? Is it running as a, you know, like a React Native wrapper or something like that? What does it look like to you in the future? So why don't we kick this oh, off and I'll pass more the intro would be to get rid of the tag and Babel. <laughs> um, yeah, one year term. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, in the long term, I cannot see JavaScript becoming a language that is widely used unless you get types in the larger. But everybody here uses, or a lot of us are trying to use Flow or TypeScript. Um, Unless it's natively installed, it won't have acceptance, a wide acceptance. Right. What, so why, just out of curiosity, like why are people using stuff like Flow and TypeScript? It's just easier to collaborate. If you, even for me, if I have a large app, I sometimes totally forget. Like my code last week is, I don't even know what I did last week. <laughs> like, uh, it's it, I, I short term memory. Um, and with, with types, it was just easier to, to remember. It's just code that tells me what to do. Right. Okay, so probably types are going to be. Yes, that makes sense. Um, Nick, did you follow? Yeah. We have to get two of these like oh, this yeah. order. <laughs> like, I'm curious because like I, like WebAssembly is coming, and I feel like technology may be cyclical, and everything goes back to Visual Basics .NET, and we all just drag and drop components. So I, I'm curious because I I think that <laughs> might happen more like medium term because we're seeing a lot of like designer stuff, but maybe programming tools become drag and drop. So uh, that was just something I was curious about. Maybe um, sort of building off what Nick said, um, like I, I, I see the benefits of WAS and WebAssembly. And I, I, maybe not by 2019, but I do hope that it catches on. And like maybe we're not even coding in JavaScript at all. We're just using the same language that we use on the back end, but in the front end. Just because with Node, that's been such a, a powerful tool, I think WebAssembly will like let us do the same thing, but with like proper languages. <laughs> I'm actually a bit more optimistic about JavaScript, and I think it will survive and it will strive in the sense that it will become better and better over time. So, like you know how there's been transition to ES6, which is was awesome, we all felt it. Now there's ES that's 2017 where we did even more stuff. So I'm optimistic and I think that we'll keep refining it and make it better and better. Okay. Right. Yeah, so first of all, I'm similarly um, significantly more optimistic about the future of JavaScript um, in, in the recent context than I would have been a couple years ago. And uh, I'm actually super bullish on TypeScript. I really like working on TypeScript. Uh, I think it's a big step forward. And you know, if it continues to see more adoption, I think it will become more a cornerstone of the, of the JavaScript ecosystem as a whole. Um, and I think one of the things, like in JavaScript applications, I think one of the big things that we're going to start seeing 
um, which Casey uh, referenced a little bit in his talk, is this movement towards um, uh, more on-demand loading of uh, parts of applications. So right now, is with this movement towards single page applications, you're ending up with these very large applications which are being written in JavaScript and being delivered as this massive payload. And you're starting to see some of this functionality emerging in the frameworks. And I think thinking about how to make an application work that way will develop so that you're only loading parts of the application as the user's interacting with your app over time. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have something? I have yeah. yeah, actually. So Ben covered a lot of this, but I think when we're talking near term, like 2019, big things are HTTP2 and this no longer being afraid of having multiple requests and so lots of smaller requests and then of course modules making that much easier to uh, do from a JavaScript perspective. So I think that'll be a big shift over the next two years kind of term is going more modular, not the big bundles. And uh, as far as tooling comes, then uh, uh, methods that will make it easier to scan your code and see which library functions you're actually using and only load those ones. Don't load the whole library if you're not using it all. So that's something that I think is really cool. So, um, uh, two trends I'm seeing, and maybe this isn't right, but uh, one is with native JavaScript, the movement into the mobile space. Uh, and the other one is uh, higher level languages that uh, compile or transpile to JavaScript. So things like Python transpilers and L. And we'll probably see more of that. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we're talking about these modular, modular, modularization about like JavaScript and front end and to back end. Um, if if you wanna have small modules and you wanna deploy all the time, and everybody should deploy in your team, right? Everybody should be able to deploy. You need a massive infrastructure, and that infrastructure is a pain in the ass. Uh, not everybody has it, and everybody wants to have it. Um, like companies like Netflix, they they have talks online. It's like I would never come up with that. Whatever they have, so um, the tooling needs to improve too. Um, yes, every, I mean if if you have like fifty people, and there's like twenty front end guys, they should deploy without like putting a dent in in your code. Yeah, tooling. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit more out there, but uh, uh, I think there's a place for dynamic typing and a place for strong tech language like TypeScript. I'm a huge fan of TypeScript, um, but I also work in a way bigger team. And if you're in a really small team, like one dev or two devs, there's a lot more advantages to like the dynamic typing, get things done quicker, and, and you know the code. Um, I think if WebAssembly doesn't change the world by 2019. I think in 2019 we'll start hearing talk of even splitting JavaScript and putting some of the things that are in TypeScript into native JavaScript and possibly splitting to like a lighter JavaScript with a dynamic typing and then more like heavyweight JavaScript that's got strong typing and all that. Mm -hmm. Heavyweight in terms of like bigger projects. I know one thing that I wanted to kind of ask people over here. Um, one thing I've been thinking a lot about is um, in terms of de deploying apps. And like, you know, right now we kind of have this concept of like an app that runs on the front end and it's like a front end app and you have like a server component, but you're starting to see a lot of apps where, you know, half the app is kind of on the client and half is in the server and like having that distinction even in terms of the way your teams are built and stuff like that um, can really just be like an artificial barrier and slow stuff down. So one of the things I've been looking at is for, for some of the newer apps I'm looking at building is whether uh, I can use something like serverless, where you basically go and instead of deploying an app, like you're just deploying functions and stuff like that, like you know, different pandas or cloud functions or something. Um, and I, but I haven't used a lot of that myself. So I was curious, like, has anyone here used that or had experiences with serverless apps? Um, I've played around with uh, AWS Lambda a bit uh, for purposes like that, where you have something like, um, actually a really straightforward example is where you have uh, an API you want to consume, and you have uh, tokens, you know, API credentials that you don't want to expose publicly. Um, 
so you can, you know, instead of having to run an entire server back in infrastructure for that, you can wrap those in like an AWS Lambda call, basically proxy those calls, and it works great. Mm -hmm. And uh, the learning curve is, is a little bit steep. So it's one of those ones where for any given problem, it's not really worth the cost of learning it. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm actually really excited about it now for, for exactly that type of thing, like being able to build these apps that are mostly front-end apps and for the little bit of back-end functionality, I, I, you definitely could get away with that. Yeah, I've been messing around a little bit with um, serverless stuff. There's the serverless framework, oh, okay. um, which basically you sort of store all of your functions in config files, oh. and um, and it kind of helps you. It's a little bit like Kubernetes or something for serverless. Okay. Um, and then on Google Cloud Platform, their um, Google Cloud Functions mm -hmm. is it's really actually pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of log in, create a new function, write it in JavaScript or Python, mm -hmm. and um, you can kind of write it right in the browser as well, mm -hmm. or, or on your own machine and, and upload it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do a ton of little things like that. When you just need like a Stripe payment, endpoint, or like I hooked up a, a thing to my buzzer on my building. I, did, I don't want to run that on a server. Yeah. So like for a serverless function, it's, it's perfect because it's you know, nobody ever comes to my house, so it doesn't cost me any money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One back here, I So I'll just be a little bit contrarian and say that as long as there's one library running, one Windows 95 machine running, Internet Explorer 6, JavaScript's never going to change. <laughs> All right, well, on that, on that happy note, <laughs> why don't we move on to the next slide? I think we've actually covered the next slide a little bit. Um, we've talked a little bit about how development will change. Um, you know, I know people talk about using TypeScript, a little bit about transpilers. Um, I, and I know for me, right now, I kind of accepted that I'm living with transpilers and they're, like, they're happening. But at the same time, like, I do hope one day, maybe not 2019, but like one day there will be enough there that I can throw that away. Because I just... For me, one of the reasons I like JavaScript is because it's not something like Java where you're compiling these big things before you can even see something on the screen. And it feels like JavaScript is moving in the direction of like having to wait 10 seconds before you see stuff. So yeah, that would be my vote, is like hopefully we won't be transpiling in the future. Well, Node, Node uh, got rid of, the, I don't know which Babel files, but it got rid of some Babel, so your transpiling time is shorter. Mm -hmm. Or you can use a lot more ES6 without Babel. Uh, but what exactly? I just looked at the release. Mm -hmm. One purpose they're always moving too, isn't it? Sure. Were there any other kind of things about in terms of how development might change? Man, like uh, back in the early like Ruby and Rails days, there was this whole like thing where every every other developer was giving a talk about developer happiness, and like it, it was a crazy huge movement. And uh, I, I thought it would catch on, and now, now we're in compiler craziness, and I feel like it's moved away from that. So um, I would I would like to see a return to developer happiness and simpler tooling. Yeah, I, sure. yeah. I don't know. I, I I don't. Everything's getting crazier in Facebook. -y, more enterprise. <laughs> that's, that's exactly true. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, there are other things like you might, um, like for example, if you want to develop fast and you want to develop a prototype, you use Meteor, right? Meteor is, you just start developing because everything is set up. Mm -hmm. But if if you have to change down the road, uh, you have to start from scratch again because you have to overthink a couple things that you didn't anticipate at the beginning. Right. So it's like, it's not, it's not beginning of 2000 anymore. Right now, we really need, still need teams mm -hmm. to pull something off. I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. I'm just thinking about that comment a bit. Um, we, we still use Rails uh, very aggressively, and there, there are a lot of aspects in, in like the Rails um, project that lent itself to that, where you know, you really you just had um, you know, this one uh, you know, CLI that you had to work with, and it kind of gave you everything, and there was a lot of magic. 
But I think um, like Rails kind of emerged out of the, the chaos of web development up to Rails and it kind of like took a lot of the ideas that were out there and coalesced them to this nice package and put it on Rails. So I feel like in, in the JavaScript ecosystem we're, we're kind of in that same kind of the state before that mm -hmm. where if you look at you know the grunts and the gulps and you know the earlier like the Batmans and the earlier attempts at front end you know frameworks and um, you know where now you're starting to see better tuning emerge like Webpack and you, you know like Create React app and like it, it does feel to me like we're actually starting to maybe see a point where we're, we're there's been enough chaos and we've kind of started to figure out some of these things and become a little bit more standardized and and uh, get more consistent ideas about how things should work across the ecosystem. And really that's where tooling emerges, is when, when people are doing things in consistent ways, you can bring in tooling that helps with it a lot. If everyone's doing things in different ways, it's really hard to make tooling that actually makes things easier. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Turn around turbo ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I know um, we've talked about these a little bit too, but um, you know, we, we, in terms of specific things in the browser, I know there's a lot of stuff that's changing right now um, that would be really cool to see catch on. Uh, ben, like, I knew you were gonna talk about service workers next month, and like that's something that I think is really has a lot of potential just in terms of that idea, of, like a page having some residual agent running in the background. Because um, like, there's things that we can do with that right now, but there's so many other possibilities for like cool stuff that you could do with that as well. So like for me, I think service workers are pretty cool and I hope that that as a spec and like as what you can actually use in the browser grows in the next few years so you can do more interesting stuff with it. Um, were there other kind of potential technologies like that um, that people were interested in? Yeah, I well, I'd say there's two. Uh, um, one I still have hope for is native web components and them getting to the point where you can drop virtual DOM type uh, structures for dynamic apps where you have a lot of similar components that you're adding and removing with different data. Uh, there was actually a big proposal just today. WebKit is trying to uh, propose basically enhancing the HTML template element so that it can actually do full templates. Like current template element is so underpowered compared to templates we're used to. And they're, they basically got a proposal that is like handlebars, but native in the browser. So probably not by 2019, but one day that app might be what uh, turns uh, native web components to replace uh, virtual DOM. And then the other thing that uh, maybe JavaScript devs are quite so up on is uh, the Houdini project, which is CSS project, but it's basically uh, allowing you to script your own rendering. So uh, I'll have to send you the link, but somebody just put together some really neat demos. So it's things like you declare your own CSS property, the CSS variables, but not just as a variable, as a custom property that you can say something like, uh, instead of uh, border radius having rounded corners, have uh, border sort of clipping. No, as a CSS property on one side, so you say like this new property for what your things are, but then on the other side, you register the code for how it actually renders and it's not running as, like most existing JavaScript codes for hand and rendering, it's okay, it's doing a bunch of calculations but the end result is you're setting the same CSS properties that the browser knows how to draw on screen. But this is actually directly painting pixels and changing the shapes that are being laid out and so that's, uh, going to really open up a lot of new options as far as anything that's getting really graphical, interesting rendering, interesting layout. You guys can patch most yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know if this will change things, but I, I'm sort of optimistic is um, just a better story with web workers and sort of sharing memory between workers and stuff. It would be be sort of nice if we could use threads 
when we wanted to use threads without it being a huge hassle. And maybe all it takes is just a library to sort of wrap that nicely. But I, I think that'd be a cool thing and could change how we render stuff. I, I think just I think there is a Vue text primitive that some of the browsers are working on this like that. But I don't know who's going to do it, who's going to adopt yeah. it, and stuff like that. I feel like we're right on the precipice of it being sort of usable in everyday scenarios. Yeah. Well, this might be a bit controversial. Um, uh, I think in the future we're going to see everything just rendered directly into uh, Slack, and we won't have to <laughs> get rid of the browser. Yeah. <coughs> I'll just quickly because I have the mic. One of the things I would really like to see, I don't know if we will. Um, I know Google's working on it, uh, moving us in this direction, but. A better mechanism for authentication and identity management. It's just like such a massive pain in the butt to have like every single separate tab in a different app have its own concept of who I am that I have to like log into and getting kicked out of my Google, you know, users all the time and having to re-auth and use LastPass and use Authy and like the whole hodgepodge of like how to securely have all these different identities right now and the browser is just a mess. I was just going to piggyback on the Slack comment. Um, I don't know if you saw somebody wrote a browser that runs in uh, Sketch. Um, so React, they, so somebody, I think Sketch made a React renderer. And then so somebody, yeah, wrote a browser for yeah. Sketch. <laughs> so what can you do with that? You can render React into, like, into Sketch. React into Sketch? Yeah. What's the problem? Wouldn't that be the better the other way around? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to share like a style guide with like your, your design team? Oh, okay. Yeah. If you want to keep a style guide around, like a living style guide, and <clears throat> transport around that way, it I think behind the scenes Sketch uses JSON um, uh, to store yeah to store all of its data. So which is kind of nice because it can be dipped, it can be like put in Git and whatever. But um, but yeah, one of those one of those things I think is rendering. Uh, yeah, react into, into Sketch. Probably had a 10 seconds. you use it for prototyping or something, maybe? Or? I don't know. Um, I don't want to actually, I just did this the other day, and I don't totally know all the details of it, but um, I think it was, I was using, switching back and forth between Chrome and Firefox, and I paid for something in Chrome, and it just asked me to like, use my fingerprint order to authenticate who I was, and it filled out all the credit card information, and actually like submitted the transaction. Um, and so I looked, and there's actually a spec for basically like managing credit card requests through JavaScript. And so you keep your details in the browser, um, and then it goes, fills it out, and they send it back through a JavaScript object. But the cool thing was, that I, like, looking at it, there's actually stuff in like, the Apple browsers to kind of do that. There's stuff in the Chrome browser, there's stuff in like, um, Samsung's browser, I guess, and, um, and Firefox doesn't really, but it's working on it. But so this spec was supposed to like smooth that all out. And I was thinking that's really cool if I'm like selling stuff online. I don't know if I like that. I'd just be able to pay with my fingerprint on websites now too. But it was still kind of cool as like, if I was trying to sell stuff, I would definitely make sure I was doing that. So. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about like what we would like to see and all this stuff is really cool and fancy. Um, but one of the things we haven't had to talk about is like, what do we hate that we don't want to be doing? Like, I, I know the trans filing is a, a pretty, Pretty clear one that people don't like. But is there other stuff that you're doing right now, maybe that you wish in a couple of years it can just go away? Um, so the opposite of transpiling. So in, in our current Rails tech stack, um, because of the version sprockets that we're currently able to run, we do not have source maps. Oh. So it means going into my uh, bug report, going to that exact line and file in the in the compile of JavaScript code, and trying to look for some kind of magic string or something, that then I can then go search the project and try to figure out where the hell that code came from. <laughs> so I really hope to not still be doing that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. um, I know someone, was, was it, Steve, were you complaining about CSS? And, or someone was complaining about CSS flow in their apps and how like so much of the CSS is something that you don't use right now? Um, like that one. Yeah, I think right now it's, I think it's uh, 90 some, 94 percent of the CSS on our website on investpedia.com is not used on any given page. <laughs> and so it's a pretty big file to be downloading and using like 6 percent of it. Um, but I think we're actually, we've got a developer who's webpacking all that. He's spent like a month going through everything. And there's something in webpack that he does well. So. 
I hope it goes well that we're not dealing with. Well, I mean, that, that's kind of a thing that I think CSS itself, too, maybe I'm going to go to kind of our CSS now, so you can with but like, you know, I know it, it doesn't lend itself well to scoping things, and I think, you know, as you see stuff get more modular, I think it would be cool if the actual specs picked up a bit more of that and made it easier to say, you know, this is the CSS that I'm actually using on my page, this is all the other stuff that I'm not, and be able to say that with authority and kind of discard it, because you are seeing like lots of CSS assets. Well, that's where the native web components are going to make the difference. Um, any other bit about CSS scoping is pretty thrown out. CSS scoping is going to be done through web components. So the idea is, okay, on this particular page, I'm using my uh, sign up form component. Well, it's going to load the sign up form CSS, and, or and inside the sign up form component, there's the. Uh, extra special call to action button component and it's going to have its own CSS and then again so that's where you're hopefully going to see modular CSS really uh, becoming something that's fun because I mean there are lots of things to do modular CSS right now the problem is getting the tooling that can quickly scan <coughs> your generated HTML and know which CSS you need and if your generated HTML is a bunch of component, custom component <coughs> it tags, then it's much easier to match those up to the CSS. And uh, so uh, hopefully, but again, components have been slow going, so I don't know about 2019. <laughs> <laughs> that question is about Martin that they had asking us like what to do or what do you want to do, right? <laughs> this, this question here, the question of what you don't want to do is a lot harder than asking us what we want to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if we talk about CSS, um, I would like to have a context where a uh, website where I don't have to make sure that I know what um, responsiveness means. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, I, I'm not a big good front-end guy. I just <laughs> want to make sure that my page knows, okay, it's on a phone yeah. and not on a browser on a browser on a laptop. Um, one thing I'd like to not be doing um, is paying like five thousand dollars for my work machine anymore? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I've just been getting really like kind of fed up with uh, how much money I'm shelling out and how the quality seems to be dropping away. This is probably going to sound like an old man, right? But uh, but I've been looking at like Ubuntu a lot more lately and like kind of other other options that just seem a lot more reasonable. So what I hope is that some of the design tools that I really, really need, come over to Ubuntu. That would be amazing. Yeah. So what I don't want to be doing in two years, but I'm afraid I will still be doing, is thinking about things at the request level and the individual project <coughs> level. And I don't want to do that anymore, whether it's HTTP2 or components or Somebody wrote a really clever thing that's going to pre-parse all of my HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. I want to be able to just write the code and not think about segmenting it to make it responsive. Whether or maybe we'll just all get you know 100 gigabit microwave implants in our hands, right? But you know, <laughs> this might be a little futuristic, but um, I think on, on that sort of front, like. I feel like I'm kind of behind the game. I'm a self-taught kind of guy and, and haven't been that active over the last couple of years and I feel like it's never ending catch up. It's like as soon as you get your head wrapped around one thing, it's like 40 other things. Like if you take, like if you want holidays and come back here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Just don't take holidays. <laughs> um, I kind of like the Jarvis, you know, like uh, Iron Man's computer thing. Like if someone deployed like, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence on like all of GitHub, could it learn like some patterns and like you just say like look I want this to happen yeah. and then it's more about like your intelligence and your ability to reason through a problem and less about semantics and like all these little things. Like I feel like at some point it's going to be there yeah. and then it'll just kind of be scary okay. and exciting at the same time. Okay. That's actually a really good segue into the very last slide which is um, 
what would you most like to change? So then you have like a billion dollars and like control over Google and Microsoft and all the browsers and everything. What would you want like in your perfect 2019 to be doing? What would the browser and JavaScript and stuff look like? I'll just like extend on that. I would like to just talk to my computer and, and have my logic turned into, I don't even care what as long as it happens. Because yeah. uh, then I don't have to do all this project that seems like a never ending thing that I'll never you know, get on top of. Yeah, okay. I could combine the last one with this one, is that I don't want to have to care what browser the user is using. Mm -hmm. So what I'd look, most like to change is I would not, like, I'd like to not have to care about what browser the user is using. <laughs> I, they'll put you know, polyfills or transpiling or whatever it's required. Mm -hmm. I don't have to think about it anymore. That's the number one thing I'd like to change. Yeah. Uh, the thing I'd most like to change about web development is uh, browsers that seem to be focused on developers rather than users. In the world of developers, of course, you want the browser that does everything just what you tell it to do. But when I'm on the website and the auto-playing video starts up and it's slowing down the things I care about and it's chewing up my data plan and it's just, I want more control on the user side of being able to set more permissions and turn things off. And, uh, well, iPhone does that. If they do. They do certain things. They don't do other things. And I think we need a more organized structure for all of these things, so that from the developer side, it's easier to. Uh, I mean, they're trying to do this with like some things. You ask permissions, and it pops up. But it's, uh, it still seems. Lots of websites you go to don't give a darn about your data plan or what you're actually trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is sort of a selfish one. I just think it would be really cool if it was sort of socially acceptable to just sort of make my website just a canvas with 100% width, 100% height, <laughs> and just render to it. Like, I think that'd be fun, um, but it'd probably make everyone hate me. <laughs> well, what do you have on that website, a button? <laughs> Actually, yeah, to piggyback off that, I think, um, I think I would, if I, it would, it would take a magic wand, because you'd have to kind of, you know, be able to not have to worry about legacy anything, but just completely change the layout system mm. in CSS. It's, I don't, I just, I think it works for documents. I don't think it works for apps. There's many other layout systems that uh, they do work and they're, they've been proven to work. Um, so having one of those in on the web would be mm. amazing. Sorry, I'm not sure if this answers this question directly, but it's just something that occurred to me that I ran into recently, is that um, a lot of people struggle with scrolling. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing you can do is to make websites more readable like books, where you just mm -hmm. turn the page rather than scroll. Mm -hmm. And this puts uh, less cognitive pressure on people. So, uh, and this is one of the barriers to the adoption of e-books, e for example, mm -hmm. and for people reading material online. Mm -hmm. So with text-based stuff, I think eventually we might switch to websites where you flip the page like that yeah. rather than scroll. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but isn't that kind of what more used to be paged and now it's... No, it was never like that, yeah. Well, I, I think the scrolling phenomenon like now the big trend is towards put everything on one page and you just scroll. It used to be click here for the next page, click here for the next page. Infinite scroll with digitization. Recently yeah. there's a movement towards infinite scroll. Infinite scroll. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but... You're saying go the other way. No, no I'm, I'm, it, it's, not, it's not the same effect as the way you used to have, um, I mean, go back to the early days of the web, then you clicked on a, on a, on a link Yep. and it took you to a new page. Right. That's not what I'm talking about. Now what you've got is you've got JavaScript 
functionality which will flip the page and give it like a, a book reading type effect. Mm -hmm. So that's very different. Yeah. It's a completely different feel to clicking on a link and going to a new page, which might take time to load. Right. Yeah, hi, Jack. Yeah. Um, so I, I sit, I sit on the full stack, so kind of all the way from the database all the way to the front end. And, um, one of the hardest parts of that is thinking about where your business logic lives and duplicated business logic. So having to have business logic live both on your server and in your app and trying to figure out which parts may make sense in both places. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to have like good standard conventions about that. You're, you're making one-off calls about that all the time. And there's been some attempts like Meteor, of course, was, was one of the big attempts of like having like one centralized source of business logic that would run on both the server and the client. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen good answers to it yet. Mm -hmm. I, I know one thing that I would like to see is, um, like right now, you know, we're still using kind of HTTP and the, the concept of like clients and servers as being this kind of unbalanced relationship where even though like, our clients have changed so much in terms of what, like not just the, the network access they have, but what they can do has changed, like the processing power. Um, so you're looking at like things like Beaker and, um, you know, even stuff like, like there's something called Scuttlebutt or, or like even Bitcoin and things where it's more distributed and the network itself is starting to get more um, distributed in terms of like single points of failure going away. Um, and like the way the processing happens is changing. I really like to see that change where, you know, if you have uh, like a website or content, you shouldn't have to have, you know, a million dollar AWS budget to host parts of it, you know, because that, that is like, that's a huge barrier for a lot of people. Like you can have a great idea or like interesting content, but if you don't also have you know, the funding and all that kind of stuff to scale it, even if you have like 100,000 users that want to use it, that doesn't make any difference. So it would be cool to see stuff where you know, it's not just even static content that you can distribute to something like Beaker, but it's like some of the, you know, the, the stateless kind of cloud functions and things that you can distribute to the people using your site so they're like using it and also running it at the same time. So I don't know, I'd love to see like more peer-to-peer -peer <coughs> At some point, if I had control of Microsoft and Apple and Google and everything, uh, I would make sure they all have the same time zone library included natively in the browser. <laughs> um, I think it's ridiculous that it's 2017 and time zones is still a nightmare without some huge third party library. True. I actually heard the developer, I can't remember her name, um, who does moment, has started doing some stuff with the W3C. But I don't know where it's at. But yeah, I read that a couple weeks ago. I was like, yes, why <laughs> did this not happen? Yeah. yeah. Um, what about other stuff? Like even just uh, you know, in terms of the way you use apps or you know, write apps, if you could do anything. You know, you do. Well, how do you use apps? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, right now, like the way we use apps, we think about them as websites and stuff. Like you were talking about you know, voice. So I think that's something like we just got that like, Google Home thing, and my kids are. Crazy with it, like it's weird. Like even stuff that like I would not have even thought to say it, they'll all just ask it randomly. It's actually kind of scary because I'm like, I don't really know how I monitor the content they're getting. Like, I'm not just talking with the computer now, but like stuff like that is pretty cool. How do they use it? Just like curiosity. They will. They'll actually just walk up to my phone and be like, because like I'll use it a lot in the car and things when I'm driving. And so like in the car is usually where they do it. Either the car or the kitchen, and they'll just like my son. I'll shout up. Um, he really likes this song called Mountain Music by Alabama. So he'll just like be in the back seat shouting, okay Google, Mountain Music by Alabama. And he'll just keep doing that, usually until I ask it to play it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, voice is interesting. Maybe, maybe uh, like to be able to do more of the hardware stuff. Um, I don't want to send a PowerPoint presentation to a service to get images back, for example. Mm -hmm. Hardware near more. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I guess, what I would like to be doing. Or better song quality. Mm -hmm. Typing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, yeah. It's hard to see. <laughs> One thing I notice is even with extensive unit testing, how much time you still spend manually testing oh, an yeah. app. And I think. Like headless Chrome just is pretty new. It's a few months old. Um, it's so, something I, I think I'd be pretty excited to like, 
learn how to, you know, optimize apps that way and test, you know, bits of an app or a, an individual component, you know. So I think we'll see more libraries that are geared towards that. Or maybe like, you know, statically analyzing CSS to see which parts of it you don't need. I think there's all kinds of possibilities there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got. Yeah. Right. Then why don't we wrap it up after uh, a few of your okay. things? Before we, this is just more. This is just like in addition to that one. One thing that like I keep on thinking about, and I really, really, really want, is something um, you know coming out of uh, machine learning and simulation stuff that can simulate a user, not like click on this, click on this, click on this, but like. You are, you know, a, an analog of a you know, forty-five-year-old, you know, with this persona and that the kind of like understanding that person has the technology. Here's my app, go, and like being able to do like integration testing that's that form versus huh. like me manually doing it or having to write a very like specifically scripted, completely artificial mm -hmm. like integration. Like a colorblind user or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. or even just like your normal user, so that like. <coughs> Okay. So Sorry, okay. Sorry is, does anyone here use eye movement uh, technology for uh, in their design? Like you mean like eye tracking and stuff? Like yeah. That? So no. people are using um, eye tracking software for, for web design layout to basically work out uh, where people are looking, and and so what you do is you use the information from that to input that into your your web design to so the front end web design. Cool. Okay, I think Dave's the one where you, just, you had your hand up. I, I saw that. Okay, I'm sorry. So one thing that I've been thinking about um, that'd be kind of cool, and uh, someone's mentioned kind of the hassle of like logins and authentication and stuff like that. And as machine learning gets more advanced, it'd be interesting to see tracking of like you know even like mouse or trackpad patterns, how you type, just like really really like small gestures that are unique to you and sort of pattern that so you can have maybe intuitive like authentication where you don't actually have to physically type in a password and then maybe sort of like giving a real hard think about like variable like levels of authentication like do you have to be full authenticated like how important is that for this part of the service that you're actually participating in because um, that would make life I mean really cool um, so just sort of pick something up and just use it you know like go to any computer and just kind of knows who you are and based on that intuition will give you X access, and then yeah, maybe you need to like log in to do a credit card stuff or whatever. But. Right. Oh, that'd be boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well guys, on that note, why don't I take, I'll grab the mic back and we'll wrap it up. All right. Well, uh, well, thank you, everybody. I have to admit, this discussion at the end has like often been my favorite part of the night. The uh, the talks are always really interesting, but the discussion is always really cool too. So, thank you for doing this and putting up with enjoying it. Thank you. Um, quick thank yous to everyone. Uh, thank you to both our speakers. So, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Those were good talks today. I, uh, I also wanted to thank Dave. We haven't had pizza in a while because we try to support like local businesses and stuff. And so I challenged Dave with finding like good local pizza. So I think you did a good job with that. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to. Uh, well, sorry, what is the name of it? You told me. Pizza Limited, you said? Pizza Unlimited. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. It was good. The Um, I also wanted to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, these guys are great. Uh, both Jobber and uh, Investopedia have really stepped up to the plate this year and done a really good job of supporting us. So I just want to say thank you guys. We appreciate it a lot. Does anyone here represent either of those? Uh, we have uh, Ben here from Jobber. Yeah, we've got a couple of Jobber. Okay, if you're here from Jobber, uh, raise your hand. Okay, actually, okay, we've got two guys from Jobber uh, and a couple guys here from Investopedia too. Um, Steve over there, and um, you guys are hiring right now, is that right? Um, not right now, um, but I'm guessing in three, four months, we probably will be again. Oh. So, trying, trying. Okay, um, and Ben, are you guys hiring if people are looking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, so if you're looking for jobs, make sure to talk to them. 
Uh, I also wanted to lock up my slides, apparently. <laughs> there we go. Specific types of people right now, right? That's what I saw on LinkedIn. I did, there, there's our list of job postings, and then there's one a little higher, which are not always the same. Thing. <laughs> so yeah, we're like, if you look at our job postings, it's more specific things, but you know, always the right person. Like developers, yeah. And if you're looking for spe the specific jobs, we do have them listed on our website. And most of them actually link back to your guys' no, job it's, postings. No, it's curious too. because you never post any job listings, but this time you did. And I thought maybe that was a specific one. Oh, no. Well, I was just sharing one posting. Uh, we do we do post uh, job postings. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to, well, either follow the links um, or if you go to our website. Yeah. yeah, if you go to, I think it's jobword.com slash careers, and yeah. then it's, I usually yeah. check it on there before they put up just to make yeah. sure I'm not missing any. Um, the other people we'd like to thank is Startup Edmonton. They give us this space every month, and they're really generous about it. They're really a breeze to work with, so thank you. And uh, reminder, next meetup, the 22nd, uh, speakers, demos, still wanted. And code night, November 15th, uh, jobber offices, and follow us, and drinks. Drinks, drinks, drinks. Okay, uh, drinks. I also just wanted to point out that uh, Steve has arranged for Investopedia to um, buy some drinks. I think there's yeah. 10 of them tonight, is that I, right? I have 10 drink tickets left. If we run out, I can probably get some more. So. Okay, so should they harass you up here or downstairs? Up, up here or downstairs, we don't catch drink here. All right, so catch Steve as soon as you can if you'd like a drink downstairs. Um, and even if you don't get a drink ticket, come down. It'll be fine, I promise. Thank you for coming. See you next one. ExchangeJS is Edmonton's JavaScript meetup. Thanks to our sponsors, Jobber and Investopedia. Support the meetup and like and share this video. And stay informed by following us on Twitter and meetup.com. Links in the description. See you soon!